welcome to a very hot England, wherever everybody's watching this, <laughs> says she in a hoodie, just about managing to wear a hoodie still, but, <laughs> but uh, welcome to the, uh, it's August already, how is it August 2020, that's impossible, but it's now our August uh, webinar, so our second one of this series, um, but the first in our shared endeavour, um, and I was just explaining before we press record and when some people were in the room, but uh, Janet and I divided up the uh, the tasks. Somebody was going to write for destinations and somebody was going to do the presentation tonight. Um, and I said, as I've talked for most of the Commonwealth, uh, I, I give Janet the opportunity to speak <laughs> instead of listening to me. <laughs> but uh, as Janet's already said, we're gonna be talking about um, our employment shared endeavor and she would like people to uh, chip in with their places as things go along. So I'm sure it's a led by Janet B but uh, but lots of uh, interaction from the rest of us as well so I'll pass over to you Janet. Okay thank you very much. Um, can somebody more technically minded than me talk me on how to uh, share the screen? Yeah press share screen at the bottom. <laughs> there isn't a share screen at the bottom. Yes there is. Oh okay so whilst I'm talking I will say thank you very much for joining us. And you've already realised that mine won't be as host as disabled share screening. No, I haven't. I've oh, says you, you have. No, allow participants to share screen. Multiple. Next one down, uh, J yeah. JF. I don't know. It's like Try talking that. through the talking through the blind tonight, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Should be all right now. Yeah, no, you should be all right. Right, let's try again. So, oh, okay. <laughs> should see a PowerPoint. Yeah, you're getting there. I will make Beautiful. That. Play from start. Whoa. That's it. Out. We're Lend it. That's it. You're on. We love it. Go for it. Mine won't be as professionally put together and nicely tidied and prettied up as Janet. It's beautiful, Janet. Don't I panic work, about presentation, lovely. I work in the COVID-infected swamp that is Greater Manchester in a hospital in there, so I haven't had time, to be quite honest. No, you've cleaned it beautifully. <laughs> it's minimalist. Okay. And as we've said, we're going to this quote, this um, presentation, this, this discussion, is going to be on the first two quarters of our shared endeavour. So the first one was before the Industrial Revolution, which in my place kicked off around about 1800. It may be different in different uh, places. And then quarter two, we looked at changes in and due to the Industrial Revolution. Um, we're going to look at quarters three and four later in the year. So uh, hold the space. Now, Janet F in her presentation, yeah, the last month was talking about land type and how the type of land that you've got determines what you can use the land for and what you can use the land for then determines the type of employment that you've got in your place. Now I don't suppose you need to know much about farming to recognise that that is not prime arable land um, and so it won't surprise you that we don't have many much in the way of arable farming. And Certainly before the Industrial Revolution, um, certainly before the 16th century, it was notionally a deer park. But I don't think any deer were actually ever hunted there. They were corralled in a much smaller part of the area, some couple of miles away. And it was actually used for cow farming for oxen. And the cow farmers supplemented their incomes by a bit of domestic woolen weaving. So the women and children would do the carding and the spinning and the men would do the um, weaving. And there are still cottages around that were pretty much as they were used at the time of the hand loom weavers with the top floors, with the big taking indoors and uh, huge windows to get the light to do weaving with. So yes, you had quite a few cow farmers, you had a bit of domestic woolen weaving, there were a few pubs, usually at the top of hills, so presumably so they could rest the horses when they got up there. There were two millers, there were two clergymen, a Baptist one and a established church one. I presume there were some shopkeepers, I have no data on that before the 19th century at all, but they must have got their kit from somewhere. I really don't know very much about what else was going on in the place at that time. This sadly isn't in my place, but the nighttime economy is not a new thing. And this lady in Manchester was um, 
immersed for keeping a common body house and permitting men of bad faith uh, with the whores casually to lie. So that's not new either. And I've heard it said, and I don't know whether anybody's got any evidence for it, that if you see a seamstress or a laundress on the uh, census, that they often supplemented their income with uh, the nighttime economy as well. Since one of my ancestors was a laundress, I'd love to know whether that was true or not. But there we go. But the big unknowns are almost everything. Before the Industrial Revolution, I've no idea how they hired people. I've no idea what the range of occupations were outside of this. I've no idea what the evidence for the occupations of individuals in most cases were, as opposed to the sort of thing that generally went on. So I've got lots of names of residents and a fair idea of what people did, but what I don't know very much about is who actually did what. And that reflects the fact that before 1800, there's not an awful lot of data sources for employment in my, and certainly in my type of place. There are some in the newspapers. There are some in um, the court rolls. Mine was thankfully manorial land, so it was under the Lord of the Manor. And they kept detailed records of the various transactions that came to the courts, uh, most of which have survived back to about 1600, but they won't let you see the originals in the archives. You can only see the transcripts now because of the condition of the originals. Um, and if your place is manorial land, then manorial records are an excellent resource for what went on, particularly for who lived where and how the land was transferred from one person to another as it was bought and sold, um, often with the names of descendants to three generations or family to three generations, but sadly not very often what they actually did. So I'm going to throw it open at this point. If you are looking at the industrial, the, the time of your place before the industrial revolution, what are the sort of place of occupations that you had in your place and what sources have people found useful to take these further because obviously the sources that we have will be different to the sources that you have and reflect your different types of places so what have you found looking in your place up until say 1800 1840 something like that the time of the census shall we say now i can't give people permission to we can unmute. Join in. So if if you unmute we, yourself, we can unmute ourselves. <laughs> then please do. And I've got some questions that might prompt some of this discussion. How did I, people earn a living, and did it change? Um, what was the? Were there a lot of black innkeepers, blacksmiths, and masons? Were there a few big farms or a lot of smaller ones? Were there ag labs or farm servants? And how did people actually find work? Were there hiring fairs? Were there jobs in uh, adverts in newspapers? And did people take second jobs? As an aside, I joked in the run up to this on Twitter that there's not an ag lab in sight because there isn't in my place. Mm -hmm. There were all small scale family farms of sometimes between five and 20 acres that had a couple of cows and a few pigs and if they employed anybody at all it was a living farm servant so all these people that talk about having a place that's full of ag labs i really don't know what that looks like so over to you guys i can tell you what it's like having loads of ag labs because that's what all i've got pretty much all i've got <laughs> no it's interesting because um you were talking about how to like find out about the occupations prior to um, the 1800s and I'm really really lucky that in um, in Tetcourt which is one of my places I have what what I call my my favorite um, my favorite curate because he actually writes little comments about who they were or what they did or what they died from on their burial register oh. so I've got all sorts of stuff pre-1837 um, of you know what their occupations were or where they were where they died or what they died of or what their occupation was which you might not necessarily as you said there Danny you might not necessarily get 
from many other sources. Um, and being a small place, I don't, well, yours is quite small as well, isn't it? But um, being a small place, I don't find that it gets many hits in newspapers. So I don't really find a huge amount in terms of my occupations from there. But yeah, it's mine just full of agricultural land. I've got a big manor house in the middle. So I've got your, your wealthy affluent manor owners and all the servants, of course. Um, and then you've just got your, your yeoman farmers and that's pretty much it. I've got a blacksmith's cottage um, in Luffincott, which is still called the black, the, the smithy, or I think it might be the, yeah, I think it's the smithy, um, which is right on the corner um, of a, well, I say the corner of a street junction. It's hardly a junction by most people. So <laughs> Janet knows what my place is like. <laughs> it's literally go around a bend. There's a little turning and it's on the corner. Um, but yeah, most of mine are, uh, are either agricultural labourers or farmers and that's pretty much all I've got in mind. Mm. You're lucky to have a curate that made that kind of observations. I mean mine are mainly Abel son of George was baptised and that's it. Mm. If you look at it says where he lived and if you look at they said where the, who the mother was but quite yeah, often yeah. they don't. And yeah. the further back you go the less they're recorded. Um, yeah. Yes. Marriage and death certificates in particular, well, birth, marriage and death certificates in particular can also be a source later on mm. and come back to sources later on, but that's a relatively expensive one because you've got to get your certificate to. Yeah, get well, I've, I've also, my, my tech cot, I think I might have mentioned this on a webinar many years ago for the society, but my tech cot marriage register is completely knackered. It's like, it's ruined. So there is no parish register for the marriage, uh, marriages that took place in tech cot from 1837 to current day. There's nothing apart from the GRA certificates, which I am not spending £11 on every sodding certificate. Oh, I love my place, but I am not spending that. <laughs> For those who yeah. don't know, my place consists of 12 houses in East Lancashire, so I have to extend it a little bit just to be able to draw in things which yeah. are in the life of the people who live there. Uh, it's halfway between Bury and Burnley, give or take. Mm. Um, and we'll come on to in a bit more. It wasn't even built most of it at this time. It was just cows wandered over and there was a couple of cottages. <laughs> um, but how have you, what records have you got about your ag labs other than what the um, curate wrote in the parish registers? Well, I, I like, I like my tithe maps. So I have to, have to, oh, have to, have yeah. to stop it. I know, I know. I, that's why I was just saying I have to mention that, although you're going to hate me, but um yeah no my tithe maps are fantastic for me although again they're not in great form some of them so they're pretty kind of brown on the edges even the, the current up-to-date scans and stuff um but yeah that's that's helpful in terms of who owned the farm and you know who leased it you know who the occupier was and who actually owned it because mine is is largely owned by the big manor house all the land was just leased by by the the, the local farmers in terms of whichever farm it was most of it was owned by the Molesworths and Orbins, which were the, the big wealthy family that, that owned the manor house, having inherited it from the R. Scots, which I always find a rather amusing name. <laughs> Especially as I have an R. Scott Silliphant in my one name study as well. <laughs> so I think that's like my, my A1 name. But, uh, but no, I've, I, it's generally those kind of records and there's not really that much. I mean, there's leases. I do have some leases um, in terms of leasing the land. But my place is really small, so be interested. And obviously, yours is quite small, um, Janet. I don't know what size other people's studies are. Does anyone have a much bigger study than clearly Janet and I have? <laughs> I look tiny places. <laughs> Anybody, Anybody else? Like chip in? Nope. <laughs> yeah. I'm t yours, is your place coastal or is it slightly inland? You have fishermen. Which, which place? She's got loads. Oh, any of them. Me? Yeah. yeah. Um, one, one's coastal and two are sort of six, eight miles inland and one's in the middle of Northumberland. Oh, that won't count. But, I mean, wills are quite handy for, for occupations, but of course we don't have many of those in Devon. Um, but the Northumberland one, there's, there's wills with people's occupations on. And actually, I mean, I found that that, I hate to keep banging on about this, but that general view of agriculture was quite useful as well. Yeah. Um, because that tells you what other trade, it doesn't just talk about farming, it says, yeah. so I know in Northumberland there was open cast mining, for example. Um, and, and we weren't here last time, Jan referred to that in the last session. And the video is or shortly will be available so people want to catch up. It already is. 
So I'll, like, I'll, try, I'll try and find a link while you're while you're while you're talking. <laughs> but it is difficult once you get back before the census and before the certificates. Finding out what people did is much so much harder. Yeah. Mm. I mean, a lot of it is informed common sense, to be honest. Um, looking off the land and looking off what people needed then and people need now, they will still need clothes. They will still need food. They've still got to get it. Yeah. Food. They've got to get. Well, it. Well, that's a good point, actually. You just nudged my brain. Um, my poor or rates books and accounts are really handy because a lot of those have got occupations in as well, actually, um, saying about clothing and things, because um, not so much the, the, the poor side but in terms of the paying out of the rates. But um, if it's the other side, you've sort of got, you know, so and so who was the owner of this or, you know, yeoman farmer or whatever like that which they, go, of course, go way back prior to 1837 and you know, further back into the 1700s. So I've got some, again, that's actually not, no, that's not Techcot, that's Luffincott, my other place, which is right next door. Um, that's quite useful um, for places that they lived as well as the occupations that they had. Mm. Yes, that's a good point. Uh, the poor Those best. lovely parish chess documents that we all wish on about. When it's good if they survive, they don't always survive in there. Well, my marriage register doesn't, and that's post-1837, so... <laughs> I think the second jobs thing is actually far more common than perhaps we realise, mm. particularly when you're doing things like fishing and farming, which are very seasonal. Mm. So you're doing other things at other times of the year to try and, try and keep going. Yeah, I've got a... a certificate i mean it's a little bit later but um i've got sort of a journeyman mason and glazier mm. things like that you know on sort of later certificates i mean it's not before 1837 and you know pre-industrial revolution but but they do tend to kind of name you know name the two if it's if it's on a later certificate but it is much harder as you say to find it before that and i hinted at the um illicit economy shall we say and i don't know <laughs> it's for sex work in my place but um, certainly there was a lot of poaching and anybody, oh, right. anybody who was caught in the forest before it, it, it was forest law until 1507 when it was deforested. And before 1507, anyone who was caught in the forest was a dog, with a dog was presumed to be poaching and would have to make a very good case to convince the people that he wasn't. Wow. And he didn't walk a dog in those days, clearly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, if you've got, you know, <laughs> you've got four by three miles of farmland with deer and sheep and cows and goodness knows what walking free, and mm. you're not too far over the the boundary and relatively poor and relatively hungry, the temptation to nip over and nick a, a rabbit or a sheep or a pig must have been quite <laughs> um, And given that you had, if, unless you were one of the few people who were known to live there and have good reason to be, be there, if you had no illicit reason to be there, then you would have to work hard to convince them that you were there for legal reasons. Mm. And that they come through in the court rolls from time to time, which is, uh, I love court rolls. They're fascinating reading, but uh, um, it's one of the- I'm with quite there. lucky in- Beg pardon? Sorry, <laughs> my internet <laughs> connection's a bit dodgy. So apologies if I speak over anybody. You're but I was just gonna say- on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, Dunster, in, in terms of the size, is is probably a little bit bigger than uh, would be advisable for a one-place study. It's around about 700 people, and I did have another 700 in a hamlet, which I've decided to lop off because... <laughs> <laughs> Get them! I'm not they, interested yeah, in Get them gone! Go. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's... Yeah, I've amputated part of my hey, study. Hey, I love it! Um, so, <laughs> bye-bye, Alpham. Um, it is now part of a suburb of Minehead, so I want it even less in the modern day than, uh, you know, the, than I, I would historically. But I mean, inevitably, there, there'll be some coming and going, because Alcombe didn't have its own church. So people would either have been, you know, baptised, married or buried in Dunster or Minehead. Yeah. Um, so I, I accept that. But yeah, so size wise, um, I'm, you know, a little bit large. Um, but yeah, in terms of the um, the occupations, um, Dunster certainly had a, a great yarn trade, um, you know, many, many moons back. And I'm quite lucky that the court rolls haven't been transcribed, but there was a chap called Maxwell Light who sort of went through and picked 
left out the salient points or, uh, you know, a lot of things that he felt were relevant or interesting, lucky to have those. Um, at some point, I'm, I'm, you know, when I'm brave enough, I might delve in myself and, and have a look for something. But I'm very um, into, you know, the mills that were operating in Dunster at the time, how many there were, where they were. Um, so, yeah, so I'm, in that sense, I'm very lucky to, to have that. It's a period of Dunster that I'm less familiar with, I think. I've mainly be, was been working on the later censuses. So it's it's been lovely to get a real insight into the very old history of Dunster. Mm. I was just Sorry. I was just googling. There's a there's an excellent book. Not that my area, not not that my um my place is in this area, but there's a Commons New Forest Directory of 1817 that has like a full index of like who lived where with their occupations. I believe um it's 1817, and that's for New Forest. Um, I know my place isn't there, but a friend of mine's got a copy. I think it was quite expensive. Um, but but our uh, one of my other sort of name places um where one of my unusual names ends up is um well i should say starts off rather than ends up actually but um it's in the new forest and that's really useful because it's 1817 so it's again as we've been talking like pre-census and and pre-certificates so that's quite useful for new forest i often quite forget how just how early the industrial revolution was i think of something that evolved largely over the 19th century and I have to stop and remember that most of the big inventions were actually a hundred years earlier than that and that they were implemented very early in my place and again because that's pre-census it means that the changes on the census and over the census era are less dramatic than they would be otherwise. Now the conditions locally were ideal for cotton mills we have the climate for it, it's damp and there's lots of water in rivers. We had the machines which were more suitable for cotton than for, for wool. And it became a lot easier at that time to import the cotton and we're not too far from Liverpool, about 40 miles. And cotton is first recorded in my wider era, area in about 1770. Um, and so as the machines got bigger, they needed factories in which to operate and that led to the emergence of local capitalists. So we have a spread from your farmer to your farmer weaver who would deal with the Chapman, who became either the farmer capitalist or the Chapman capitalist, who turned into the manufacturers. But this of course was competition for the hand loom weavers and as more and more textiles came out of the mills, there was more and more poverty amongst the handling weavers, which led to the frame breaking riots. And we had one locally about 200 yards away in 1876, which is a subject of the book on the right hand side. But that wasn't the only um, manufacturer. There was also quite a big local felt area um, industry. And at one stage, the wider area produced two thirds of the UK's felt. And then from the felt, people started to make slippers. And then from making slippers, people went into footwear. And later on, at the time of the First World War, that became a, an important point because shoe manufacture was a protected occupation and slipper manufacturer wasn't and you were liable to be called up. So lots of appeals and lots of tribunals from local residents hung on whether what they were making was defined as a shoe or a slipper. So it, it has implications beyond actually they just their job. It, the definition of their job determined whether they went to war or not. But the development of all these factories, they needed workers and that workers need for workers led to migration. Um, New Church is the wider area at the time in which my place now it is. And you can see there how both the total population in blue and the number of inhabited houses in red um, changed over time. And people moved in and people moved out in search of work as the circumstances permitted. 
And this is from my personal ancestry. This is 1881. And if you look at the third from the bottom, you have um, Ellen, Ellen Abbott, Ellen Stott, sorry, who was born in, in uh, Stockton, in County Durham, whereas everybody else was born in either East Lancashire or West Yorkshire. What were they doing up in Stockton for five years in 1865? Well, that was the time of the American Civil War and the cotton famine in East Lancashire. So the supply of cotton in East Lancashire drew, uh, dried up and many people were then underemployed in the Lancashire cotton industry. There were various municipal roles that they were found to do. Uh, they were paid for by the local authority, but this family uh, up sticks and went to County Durham where the cotton mainly came from Egypt and India and the supply of that was rather more uh, stable than the American cotton during the, uh, the Civil War and the cotton famine. The development of uh, entrepreneurs led to the need for servants because they're not going to do their own dirty work. And the, as the local girls went into the mill because their terms and conditions were better, servants increasingly moved in from other parts of the world. So the top one is 1851 where Mary Ann Ashworth lives with one female servant who's also born in the same area. The bottom one is the same household. Mary Ann is now Patrick. And they, by this time, find the need for five servants, none of whom were local. They'd all come from somewhere else because all the local girls and men had, had gone to the mill where the terms and conditions were presumably better. And as you built the mills, they, don't, they need resources on which to work. And the relatively poor coal reserves in the area suddenly became worth exploiting, which led to um, coal colliery owners and coal miners and the associated um, trades that go with that. And Springhill House itself, the centre of my place, was actually built by a man who moved from, cotton, from woolen manufacture over to coal merchant in, in the response to the increased need for coal due to the um, increased development of all the mills. So it's not just, you know, people are talking today about the supplier industries and the subsidiary industries that are affected when a major employer starts or stops. And that was going back even to this stage. But the conditions in the factories weren't that fantastic. And that led to the development of a number of factory acts which gradually over the 19th century improved the terms and the conditions of the people who worked in the factories. And with the factories, with the factory acts came on the right hand side, information on how to get around implementing the factory acts without being caught out. I love that. The factory acts made easy, how to work the law without the risk of penalties. So again, there's nothing new, but also that led to inspectors. And going back to there, you'll see that Charles Patrick on the bottom, top, the top of the bottom census, is, who is a resident of Spring Hill, was a sub-inspector of factories. So the need for regulation, the need for inspection, the need for ensuring compliance was back then. And people were employed in that and some of them may have lived in your place. And certainly then linking to the newspapers, some of the descriptions of the uh, investigations that he undertook and the um, prosecutions that he made can be quite fascinating and make good reading. So as the, the employment in a place will vary with the transport links. So with the railways, it became a lot easier to get stone out and the local stone suddenly became worth quarrying. Um, Trafalgar Square is flagged with local stone, as is St Anne's on Sea is largely built with local stone. But it also made it easier to get better quality coal in to supply the mills, and that meant, of course, there was less of a need for uh, pits locally. And some of the ones that had risen over the course of the early 19th century became non viable later on in the 19th century and into the 20th. And all these people need more services. So there's more inns, there's more shops, and there's certainly more clergymen. 
So by, at 1800, there were two. By 1900, there were that lot. And certainly one of the Unitarian ministers, one of the Baptist ministers lived in my place, and one of the Anglican ministers is recorded as an overnight visitor on one of the censuses, which does beg the question, what was he doing there overnight when his own house was only a quarter of a mile up the road? But never mind. We're now getting into the realm of the more traditional service sources. So we have the censuses, we have the maps, we have the newspapers, we have the trades directories, and we'll have a look at some of these. Now, I envy people who have a place who has the civil boundary that is the same as the ecclesiastical boundary that remains constant all the time and in every single census the enumerator took the same route with the same boundaries. If that's you, I'm happy for you, it isn't me. So, in the 1841 census, in the general area, there were 179 working, of whom roughly half were in the woolen trade. Interesting that female servants were vastly um, outnumbering male servants. There were a couple of independent means. And there, there's other occupations, of course, but the presence of a chair bottom, it makes you wonder whether there's a chair topper, but that's another, another matter. By the 1901 census, and this is a much smaller area that's transcribed, you'll notice that there's far fewer woolen people, it's down to two, and more cotton people than there were uh, 60 years earlier. There's, um, pardon me, a smattering of other trades that are involved as well, and not the two labourers in the gas works, because we'll come back to those later, later on, as in now. The second source that's useful to consider is maps. Spring Hill is roughly in the middle of that. And if you notice the big back black bob just to the left of the bottom, it says Rosendale Union Gas Works. And if by looking on the map you notice that there's a gas works or an electricity works or a telephone exchange, it might mean that people who worked there lived in your place or people in your place worked in some of these industries. And indeed, 1901, we have two labourers in the gas works and they hadn't far to go to work. The third place to consider is newspapers. These are from the Burnley Advertiser, which covered my place. Unfortunately, the newspapers specific to my place haven't been digitised yet. Get on with it, find my past. And you'll notice that there are people who are applying to the, who are offering situations which are vacant. So the third from the bottom, dressmakers want several experienced hands permanent situation. And there are also people who are looking for jobs and advertising their services. So above that, wanted a situation as coachman, groom or general driver by competent mum. And the one that made me chuckle when I was looking at this is ladies can have servants by applying to Laycock's pawnbrokers. And if anybody knows why on earth you would get a servant from the pawnbrokers, please will you let me know, because I haven't got a clue. And we said earlier that there's nothing done. This again was from the Burnley Advertiser, but it was actually in Burton-on-Trent. And somebody was uh, convicted there of advertising non-existent jobs for sale, taking money to send them the details, and they're never doing it. So people collecting agency fees for non-existent jobs isn't exactly a new fraud earlier. And I think that's, uh, again, just demonstrates that there's, there's different ways of, of reinventing the same scams, but the principles are pretty much the same. So we have census, we have maps, we have newspapers. We'll come on now to trades directories. And this is the first one that covers my area that I've found, which is 1825. And that is everybody who is listed in the trades directory for my immediate area. So not just Spring Hill, which he is on there actually, the coal merchant, but uh, everybody for the immediate environment in which, in which Spring Hill is. And from that, you notice two things. One is that there's a heck of a lot of base manufacturers and the other is that there's a lot of Ashworths and Taylors. And of course, I've got both Ashworth and Taylor in my personal ancestry, haven't I? Which makes it uh, quite amusing 
unravelling that lot and up pops the Baptist minister that we referred to earlier as well. Obviously, as the, the century progressed, the trade directories become more comprehensive and they become more useful as a source of occupations. But even back then, it's interesting as a snippet of the preponderance of certain trades that chose to be recorded in these directories and obviously felt it was worth their while to do so. And that obviously begs the question, were there, was that the only thing that was happening in the area? Or were there other trades that felt it wasn't worth their while advertising in this newfangled directory thing and they're not going to waste the money on it just yet, thank you. So again, over to you. How do you find these sources are applying to your place and which ones do you find the most useful? And a few prompt questions again. So what industries developed in your places and what occupations declined as a result of industrialization in your place? Certainly in mine, there was more textile, there was more footwear, there was more quarrying, in came the utilities and there was more domestic service and there was less farming and farming was never fabulous. But when it's all you can do with the land, it's all you do with the land. When you've got an alternative that makes more money, you start farming it. And uh, it was very small scale and it was mainly dairy. Um, what other new roles emerged and were they directly involved in the new industries or were they supportive? And did it alter the number of family workers and the pattern of family workers working? We don't know, but can presume that um, the farming and domestic woolen trade was a whole family affair. Certainly on the censuses that I've looked at from my place, married women are consistently enumerated as not working and I bet many of them were and it's just not down. Uh, but the children were in the mill from the age of six. And as soon as they were old enough to be employed, they were in there, go and earn some money. And you can see through the censuses that as the changes for the legal age for starting working rose, that the age of the children's in the mill rows as well. Uh, it's very interesting. And I have my grandmother's um, part-time papers from when she was allowed to go to school half day and work mm -hmm. half day. And it was the day after her birthday. Oh, wow. <laughs> Taken down there in the mill, off you go. Yeah, the day after, uh -huh. her, the day after her 12th and 13th birthdays. So again, over to you. How did your place change during the Industrial Revolution? What have you found helpful? Other people's experience might be very different if the Ag Labs went to Swindon from remote places of Wiltshire to work on their railways, for example. Yeah, well, my, mine, weirdly, um, just while you were talking there, I started going back over the censuses and I hadn't noticed that some of them had actually kind of changed the way they described themselves. Um, so in one census, they might be a blacksmith but then in the next census, they call themselves a shoeing smith. And then somebody's actually written when they've done the stats, they've actually written black, like in a different pen when they've obviously gone through and done the statistics for it. Um, but, but it's interesting, I think, for me that um, having a look through, I just went through my Luffincott ones, which are generally four pages, if that, of the census. <laughs> so I've got all of them saved. I think for, um, certainly for Liz, Dunster would be slightly bigger. But uh, <laughs> for me, it's quite easy to flip through them. Yeah. Um, and um, so, yeah, I just looked through some of those and it's interesting that the some, some of the people have come in from further afield. So if I compare the number of people in my place, particularly Luffincott, it doesn't really change all that much. But the physical people and where they've come from to be in that place is quite diverse. So the the um, the rector in 1901 is from Coventry the hell were they doing coming from Coventry down to this tiny little remote Devon village whereas before they'd always been Devonian or Cornish at least but no 1901 he, he'd moved all the way down from Coventry so yeah I think although the occupations and industries in my place don't change a huge amount the people that are doing them and the people that are resident have changed quite a lot. So you have you always have say a hundred but it's a different 100 from different places. Yeah. It's come and yeah. different reasons. I think it's kind of going back to migration as we did a couple of years ago um, for the shared endeavour. You know, my, 
migration early doors you know it was like the next parish or you know you wouldn't get people marrying somebody from the village that was miles and miles and miles away they'd be very local and um, they'd sort of be the next village or the one after that or just over the border in Cornwall but yeah as the as the years go by and I suppose transport links and such like you know people could could travel down to Devon more readily than they could have done in 1841 when you couldn't have done it so much and the roads weren't so good interesting that very few of our clergymen were lo local and particularly in the era before the industrial revolution when it really must have been quite a wild place to live yeah quality, poor quality fields that rains an awful lot they must have wondered what on earth they'd done to get sent up there <laughs> i've noticed that the the roles of the women change more for me and i think particularly where my North Devon parishes where a lot of the women were doing things like glove making. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, as that becomes more of a factory okay. occupation rather than a piecework do-it-from-home occupation, then they've all got to look for something else to do. Um, and as you get more gentry moving in, you find that, obviously, you know, more servants are then required. So they're doing that instead rather than doing the, the piecework at home. They're, yeah. they're having to go out and work places or maybe even move away to find something to do. Yeah, my, my number of servants, particularly on my farms in my agricultural area, um, it, they, you suddenly see quite a change if you compare Luffincott Barton, which is, which is quite big in 1851, to even 1881. The number of servants and the amount of land that they actually manage in the Barton is way less between you know, in that 30 year period. Um, they, they had a lot of servants and um, a, a huge number of acres. I forget how much it was, but in 1851 and then 1881, it's a lot, lot, lot less. What have they all gone to do, Kirsty? Moved out of the area, most of them. Um, as in, to a, not miles away, <laughs> Stevens <Devon> still. <laughs> but yeah, moved out of the area and gone to different farms. But farming, I think, decreased in that area in that in that 30 year period anyway. So although some of them might have been farm carters, they might have then gone and you know done something slightly different further down the track literally down the track mm. <laughs> i wouldn't say a road in those times but yeah so they, they just change i mean they're still sort of working on the land but just think in different areas right yes are yours too far away to be involved in the copper mining at, in the tavistock area kirsty yeah way too far yeah, yeah you'd have to go through that yeah, you'd have to go through uh, Lanson, as they call it. Um, <laughs> Lanson, as most, most normal people call it. Um, you'd have to go through either that or Oakhampton to get to yeah, too far so. north, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, much too far. Yeah, it's more likely to go to Cornwall. Um, it's closer to Bude than it is Tavistock. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, Tavistock's a bit too big for my people. <laughs> Far too big. <laughs> Far from my grand, but... <laughs> I don't know. Was it, what, what kind of, Liz, I'm intrigued by Dunster. What kind of occupations do you sort of have in the census that are like your, your mainstays? Um, probably I'm one of those people that has plenty of ag labs. It's Hi. quite a rural area. Um, hmm. The Dunster estate had several farms which employed um, quite a few people from the village. So, um, but there's still an interesting mix of people there. Um, they set up a village hospital in 1868, which is wow. my current place study obsession, this Ooh, okay. tiny little cottage hospital. Um, and I've been lucky enough to find uh, one of the inpatient registers, a, a short section. So, wow. But it, it wasn't a big employer in the no. area. Um, and it was staffed by a local doctor or a, a you know, variety of local doctors, some from Minehead and some from Dunster. Um, and they would advertise locally for, you know, people to work there, but they wanted a qualified nurse to be there. So, um, you know, the hospital wasn't a, a big employer locally, but it's interesting to see, you know, that obviously it involved a certain number of jobs, people being there and, you know, mm. needed people to, to sort of, look after the building and maintain it and you know yeah. community members that kind of thing but yeah predominantly it's very rural mm, okay. um, so yes but yeah there's there are a few interesting interesting little things in there so yes, well, having, a, a, having a cottage hospital i can't claim a cottage hospital list so i'm done <laughs> <laughs> 
Is anyone yeah, have a lunatic? I was overjoyed. I'd, I'd like a lunatic asylum. Does anyone have a lunatic asylum in their place? Oh, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? <laughs> Mine's too small for that. <laughs> yes, and one with photos as well. That's what you oh, really want. Definitely, yeah. A case book with photos. <laughs> yeah, we've got one actually. I was doing some research years ago at Wiltshire because I'm most of you now. I live in Wiltshire, and the um, Chippenham um, is where the record office is here. And I, I found that they had all the photos actually indexed, and you could actually search for them online. It, 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 well, only if you're in the um, the the record office. It was brilliant. And some of them you just look at and go, yeah, you needed to stay there. <laughs> you needed to not ever come out. <laughs> they were proper scary, some of them. And I looked up a couple of um, one namers, you know, names that stuck in my head. Yes, Janet, I did put yours in. <laughs> but you're all right. None of them were in the lunatic asylum in Wiltshire. But it was, I'm Wiltshire, but yeah. No, <laughs> not here. <laughs> but yeah, it was fascinating. But I, I don't have anything like that. I don't have a hospital. I had, as I say, I had a blacksmith, so I had a school um, for, for a short period of time. But then, again, as, as small village schools in Devon, you know, did over the years, they got amalgamated, and so I lost, I lost my school. <laughs> but the records were uh, fascinating. I found a, a potter unexpectedly the other day, and it was, a, I, I was what, one of these online um, sort of webinar type things about a uh, Dunster pottery kiln, which is apparently the oldest pottery kiln in Britain. And they were wow. saying, what a place to put one. You know, it's sort of in a valley. It's yeah. miles from any water and it's miles from any clay. But yeah. Apparently, um, Henry, one of the Henry Luttrells, had put it there just to animate the landscape in the same wow. way as the Luttrells <laughs> had. The Dunster's got a hill at both ends of the village. The castle's on it you know, one end, um, yeah. they had a farm built at the other end to improve the view from the castle. And apparently the installation of this pottery, I mean, all that survives now is the kiln, but it was put there literally just to make, you know, the village more interesting. And right. I thought that was a fascinating thing to do. So, you know, but it was, it created an awful lot of pots and they, you know, they're <laughs> restoring the lime kiln. And, you know, so that was a, an occupation I didn't expect to find. And no. You know, it's, yeah, so that was, yeah, very interesting. So <laughs> there still is a potter there, but completely different. Um, yeah. You know, not in any way connected with, you know, this potter. The original one. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so occasionally very interesting occupations do pop up. So yeah. um, I found a misuse, um, a, a medical electrician, not connected with the hospital. Wow. Um, so... Yes, yeah, it's a so smallish, um, rural place. You still get quite a few, you know, a few purples in there. Yeah, I think the thing for me is like if I look at the occupations now, not that we could naturally see those, but I've written, I wrote probably about 15 years ago to so all the residents of um, my two places, and most of them are retired and they've bought the, the properties, done up the properties. And they're not farming or, or anything like that. You know, they're just retirees who don't, you know, who don't want to live up in London anymore or Hertfordshire or whatever. And they just retire down to my little places down in Devon. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. Even the people who had the keys to the church in Tetcott were not originally Tetcott residents and had moved down from Essex. So it's quite interesting. And I don't know all of them. I don't know all of their backgrounds, but, but quite a lot of them are not Devonian through and through, which is a shame, actually. Because although you you know that people are going to migrate over time, you hope there'll be still some originals. But I think probably I put maybe 15, 20%, maybe 25 of Devonians in my places now. They're all, you know, well, I won't say flown in because they won't have flown from very far, but, you know, they've, they've come in from a distance. So. Yeah, so On the um, subject of sources and newspapers uh, hmm. we were talking about, um, one thing I found quite useful is um, if they happen to get in trouble with the law. Hey, um, I like it, yeah. <laughs> because then you get their name and where they came from and usually what they did. Mm. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm always pleased when one of my Waters Upton people um, got drunk and disorderly, um, <laughs> which was the main uh, type of um, mm. crime. Crime is possibly a strong word, but um, <laughs> thing, things Offen that got them up before the yeah offences that got them up before the magistrates. 
Um, <laughs> but it's also a useful supplement to the um, the census, obviously, as well. As we know, mm. the census is that ten year snapshot, and it may only give you their primary occupation. And for example, you may have someone who shows up as an ag lab every yeah. time they're on the census, but in between, you might find perhaps that they were called a carter or a wagoner. Um, which shows that there were other elements to their jobs as well. Usually if they were a carter or a wagoner, um, they were um, riding on the shafts of the wagon, um, <laughs> possibly drunk as well. Um, <laughs> it, it tends to be either or. They're in, they're in charge of a wagon drawn by a horse while they were drunk, or they, <laughs> or they were riding on the shafts, which was not legal. No. Um, <laughs> But the other one is, is obviously quite often the drunk uh, with or without disorderly. Uh, and yeah. then you get, you definitely see them down in Wellington at the um, quarter sessions. And uh, Well, you, I was literally about to say that actually, Steve, because quarter sessions sometimes for me don't give me the actual people who've been in trouble. They give mm. me witnesses that are from witnesses. my place. Yeah. They're great as well. Yeah. So although it might be that your people from your place have been in, in the uh, brown stuff, yeah, you know, it might be that actually they're the ones that are, you know, witnesses in the case. I found quite a few of those in the quarter sessions when you search for them. So that's quite good too. Yeah, that's something I need to do more on actually, the quarter session. For your drunk and disorderly, actually, they probably wouldn't turn up in that. It would be the the, uh, the weekly or fortnightly police court. Um, yeah. But quarter sessions, I know that the Shropshire Family History Society has... Um, They've transcribed or they've indexed a lot of the uh, the local archives quarter sessions for a period of time, and I've got that. I got that for my actually one name study, uh, mm. but I, I need to go through that and um, find out what the Waters Upton people were up to when they turned up in those uh, in the quarter sessions as <laughs> offenders <laughs> or witnesses or whatever. That's a good idea, actually. I'd, I'd yeah, not... Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the other thing I searched for the other day, and I don't know if it is still free, um, but because the National Archives were doing their downloads for free. I don't know if that's still the case, but what I did was went through and did a load of my place names. And although some of them were wills that I've printed A3 copies and paid through the notes for back in the day, I thought at least if I've got electronic ones, I can just dispose of the paper and just have an electronic one rather than absolutely folders and folders of A3s um, and there were some interesting things that I don't think maybe were digitized when I went through it last time so I think that's still free um, so that's definitely worth going through and seeing what's uh, for, you know free to download I think you can do 10 at a time um, and 50 mm -hmm. over a period of I don't I can't remember how long it was I haven't done 50 yes. so I don't know <laughs> I presume when I have they'll tell me <laughs> I think it's over a rolling period, so as soon as you... I thought so too, Liz, yeah. Yeah, so you, uh, it goes as you move on to the next day. Right. Um, did quite a word. Just coming basically, to an end. Get, get on and download no. quick. <laughs> they said they were doing it as yes. long as the actual archives were shut, so they may well be open. If, if the archives are open now, it may well have stopped. But it's certainly worth well, I think most archives aren't open yet. Most of them yeah. aren't. Well, some of them are beginning to reopen, aren't they? Mm. I think so with, the, the up to. with the National Archives, although they've kind of reopened, it's you can't you can't get very many people in there and they're limited no. to the number of documents. And for that reason, for now at least, I think they are continuing with the, the free oh. downloads. Get downloading, it, everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Do it, do it, do it. Quick, yeah. put your names in. <laughs> put your place names in. Go, go, go. <laughs> Nothing similar for Scotland, unfortunately. I don't know. Oh, oh. that's a shame, Jane. Are they doing anything? Because I have to say, um, Scotland's people shut, the, shut themselves down fairly quickly and yeah, there's been no ability to order or view anything, has there? Have they done national, none, nothing through the NRS or anything? Nothing. I think they are now um, doing official copies again. Those can be ordered. So the births, marriages and deaths in the last 175 and 50 years. Interesting. I haven't seen I guess, an official today. source for that, but yeah. I'll have a look because I certainly we've had to go direct to registrars to get stuff. Yeah. Um, which has been fun. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'd want to do it all the time, but it's been fun. <laughs> <laughs> 
but yeah when you want it for a place though it's totally different isn't it because you you just can't yeah yeah can't keep spending out like 12 because it's 12 pound a shot for your certificates as well isn't it for um the recent stuff yes and although if you're in if you don't need a printed copy you can just transcribe in the scotland's people centers but you is that open yet or no 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 no, no. my nearest one was supposed to be opening mid to late august and the, wow. that hasn't changed for the last four weeks there's been no update which is quite yeah well, I yeah, so it makes research. You, you suddenly realise how much you, mm -hmm. you rely on that, and then suddenly it's gone. <laughs> yeah. And I think Maybe everywhere everywhere's appointment only, isn't it? Where they have opened, it's all yeah limited entry. You must book and all this sort of thing. So yeah. Yeah, definitely. Lin Linda, do you have a place that's registered, or or have you not registered a place yet? Oh, you're, you're muted. muted. Nope, you're muted, can't... Linda. You've got to unmute yourself. I might be able to. Still can't hear. No. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, yeah. Perfect. You got it. <laughs> uh, no, I haven't registered my place, and uh, it's just interesting to hear what you're saying. Yeah, uh, sadly. Have you got I a place in mind or? Oh, yes, very much so. Okay. Uh, place I was brought up. And, oh, nice. Uh, I do sort of local uh, searches and uh, yeah. my relatives and friends are helping me, but I can't travel now and no. I get very breathless when I'm doing things. But I enjoy listening and I'm enjoying sort of researching on the internet. So, that's, yeah, that's absolutely. Really can, can we ask where your place is or are we not allowed it's to? It's in watch? Yorkshire, yes. It's just oh, okay. in Home Firth, last of the summer wine country. Oh, where oh, about it's a little place oh, yeah. called Cinder Hills, which, right. you know, Cinder's was obviously some sort of um, yeah, yeah. mining and uh, ore work. But again, there are... Um, Weaver's cottages still with the windows and things. Yeah. Uh, but it was mainly agricultural, uh, with quite a lot of ag agricultural labourers. And uh, I've, I've, I was brought up there, and yeah. uncles had, my grandfather had a farm there. So it's more the, the use of the land, and it wasn't strong enough to um, keep him and his family just yeah. by farming. So he was a miner, a carter, a quarrier you know wow and now people like you were saying they're just it's just a, a dormitory you know yeah. there's no farm there's no nothing yeah just more, more and more houses being built we'll come back have you that. found that it's grown quite a lot over the years in terms of population oh very much so mm. very much so yeah yeah oh interesting yeah yeah so i enjoy it you just Sorry. stole the pill from us linda was yeah, that? Yes, that's right. And very similar the mill. Oh, yes. <laughs> like climate and area and development, you know. Home yeah. Firth was a real mill town. Yeah. But when I left, came come to Manchester in the 60s, all the mills closed and it was really run down. But as I say, it's become a dormitory town now. And, uh, wow. you know, when, once the train stopped coming as well, that, that was a big thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, with beaching, yeah. it stopped. Uh, and even going through the Woodhead Tunnel to... Uh, to Sheffield, I mean that's closed now. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. So we're looking at the changes in the twentieth century and uh -huh. after the First World War in the third quarter. So uh -huh. if you have a look at some of the um, prompts on the website on the society's website. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ideas for taking that forward as after the First World War and the Second World War and the decline uh -huh. of the industries the rising of the, you know, the growth of the new digital industries and things like that. Mm -hmm. And that's very much what we're looking at in the, the, the current quarter. Right. And so also, my, grand, sorry, my grandfather uh, had seven children, but yet he, he, he went to the First World War because uh, they, the army were paying more than his mother. Yes. My mother was born in 1922 and ah. she was appalled that he'd left her mother with seven children, you know, uh, but the, the, the land was so poor that he had to, had to go. You know. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah. When you talk about not being able to travel, and quite a lot of us have, I'm lucky because I live in my place, but yes. I think that's unusual 
Uh, and I feel I know the place. Uh, I was brought up there and I had yeah. a lovely wild childhood with lots of relatives <laughs> and freedom, <laughs> to, freedom to roam. Excellent. And with the internet now, with Facebook, I can see these places daily, you know, so I can see what changes there are and I've still got friends and relatives. But I've got quite a serious condition that uh, I just can't, can't travel anymore. But I went for years, you know, I mean, uh, it was a... My, even though I left in 66, I used to go over at least once a week. So, and I've still, you know, got a lot of family there. Yeah. So, but, but I'm very interested in the, the development of it. So my mother's next door neighbour, is he's a, an incomer. Like you were saying, a lot of places, uh, people retire to places like Home for Earth now, or they use it to go to Leeds or Sheffield or Manchester to work. And they, they just don't know the history of the place, you know. So um, I'm trying to get something together, but. Uh, I'll go for it. But if you're, um, you're reading in Destinations and you see articles by Alex, our secretary. Uh huh. She's done Treasurer. Excellent. Treasurer, she's done, yes. She's, Treasurer, she's, sorry. Yeah. And she's done <laughs> excellent work on Wing in Buckingham uh -huh. here, from New yes. Zealand. Yes, yes. You know, so uh, uh -huh. most of us are managing to. Uh, accepted are managing to do excellent studies when you don't you can't mm -hmm. travel to your place i'm, I'm you good at work. doing the research but i'm useless at putting it down <laughs> absolutely hands up who has that problem <laughs> <laughs> i keep getting um, a butterfly mind that just goes from one place to another because i'm quite obviously very interested in the place where i live in manchester as well that's got a fantastic history to it and even my house you know the history of the house is where i live is uh, is fascinating so i have too many things going on in my brain i'll tell you what i found interesting in 1965 when our wi was 50 or something i think or 40 they compiled a book um, and they, they obviously, there's two things that came out of that. First of all, that they all knew what everybody did for a living. Uh -huh. yeah. so, so they said, you know, oh, this is where what, you know, most people work in farming and some people do this and some people do that. And um, a few people work in Biddeford, which is like the town six miles away. And one works in Barnstable, which is <laughs> 16 miles away. Yeah. And then in, tw in 2015, so like 50 years on, we redid the book. And of course, we got no clue what people do. Most of them, like Kirsty's been saying, are, are, are like me, sort of not that I'm quite retired yet, whatever that is, but you know, are, are incomers from elsewhere. Um, a lot of retired teachers and barristers and you know, accountants and that sort of thing. And I mean, to work in Bristol and Exeter and goodness yeah. knows what, and it, it's a completely yeah. different mindset. Not only that everybody knows everybody, everybody knows what everybody does, you don't even have to go around and ask. But the idea that I don't, I mean, there must be a handful of people who actually work in the village now because there's still mm. a few farms and there's a pub and there is nowhere else to work in the village. So no. you know, no, nobody, can, nobody can work anywhere. We, we lost our, our last little shop about three years ago, like a, we've got a community shop, but people don't get paid to work there, so it doesn't count. But there was a butcher's when I first moved in that's now gone. But you've got to go somewhere else to work. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're talking about marriages, you know, marrying people in the next village. Uh, my generation didn't marry too far out. I mean, I married somebody from Lancashire, which started the Battle of the Roses. <laughs> but, um, my son has married a Brazilian. My uh, cousin's uh, uh, son has married a Latvian. You know, a lot of mm. uh, the next generation down have married way out of the area. You know, so it has changed dramatically. Yeah. I wonder if we will, we will sort of start to shrink back down again in this new world in which we yes, find ourselves. Yes, very different. Yeah. Um, be interesting to see see what happens absolutely well thank you very much janet for leading us through this evening it's been fascinating as always uh, i always love hearing the different things about different people's studies because uh, mine as i've said is very very rural i don't have that much in terms i mean i've, I've not done some, some of the shared endeavors over the years because i just simply don't have enough information in my in my place so uh, it's been fascinating to hear different people's uh, experiences in their places so uh, we have 
uh, have the next date in the diary, I think, which is the usual mm -hmm. second uh, Tuesday of the month in September. So I hope yes. we'll see, see you there. Um, um, and we'll... Steve, will be, Steve will be with us in October. He will. And um, November, of course, is our, our AGM. And Liz has yeah. promised to step up to do something next year. So if okay. anyone else, if anyone else um, feels that they might like to put their names down for a date in 2021, just to, as you can tell, we all chip in. You don't have to sit and, and talk for <laughs> yeah. an hour. You just give us a few pointers and, and we're away, really. So yeah. if you want right. that they'd like to share an aspect of their place, um, then, yes, please, please do let me know and I'll... I'll diarise you, whatever the expression is. <laughs> Put you, you in the calendar. Thank you very much for your contributions, everybody, and for chipping in. And I'm sorry about the sound. I have absolutely no idea why that happened. Um, it's all right. It seems to fluctuate. Sometimes it comes in and sometimes it goes out. So we've been fine, Janet. It's okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. It's fine. Thanks very much. See you next time. All right. Time. Thanks all. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.